Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. To introduce our second speaker of the afternoon, we have another very special lady with us. Please welcome Edwina Sands. Hello, can you hear me? Because I wouldn't want uh, you to miss the wise words that's coming out of me. It's an easy thing to do just to introduce someone and not to have to make the whole speech. But I told Sir David I will only speak for, for half an hour and he'll have 15 minutes left. Now, this book, which I'm three quarters of a way through and only got it yesterday, is a very fine book and a pleasure to read. Um, yes, well, um, I used to know quite a lot about my grandfather's art, but I found a few new things in this book, and particularly uh, the second half of the book is, uh, puts in all the speeches that Grandpapa made to the Royal Academy. When he first um, made the first speech, he had not started painting yet. And then later on, and when he made the first two or three speeches, he seemed to be only talking about the Navy and things like that. And he didn't really feel um, sort of brave enough to talk about art. And he, even he seemed a bit nervous. So, but when I got a little bit further on, about 10 years later, like 1934, when he was already painting, he started um, being more comfortable, being like an art critic. He went round, um, at, uh, he, he made comments about so many of the different paintings and seemed to be explaining them more than probably the artist would have liked. And he was no longer reluctant. He was almost criticizing some of them in a rollicking way. So by the time he finished all these um, occasions at the Royal Academy, he could have really been a famous art critic. But he had many other things to do. So you are going to enjoy the book, I know. And here is Sir David Canadine. Where is he? Good afternoon, everyone. Edwina, thank you so much for those immensely kind and generous words and for promoting my book with such altruistic uh, enthusiasm. Um, there are, of course, uh, an amazing array of uh, books about Churchill uh, on display and for sale, let me add, um, outside. Um, uh, and I certainly wouldn't presume uh, to suggest that my book uh, is the best of all those that are on offer. But what my book does uh, uniquely have uh, to its special benefit is that almost all of the words in the book are not mine, they are Churchill's. Uh, and there are more Churchill words in my book than in any of the other books. So if Churchill's words are what you're after, let alone Churchill's art, then that's the book to buy. <laughs> End of my commercial uh, interlude. An old friend of mine, and of course a great biographer of uh, many significant figures, Roy Jenkins, having written the life of uh, Mr. Gladstone, uh, the greatest British Prime Minister uh, of the 19th century, then of course wrote the biography of Winston Churchill, the greatest British Prime Minister of the 20th. And having written both of these books about both of these men, he felt uh, that he was better placed than anyone else, since he's the only person to have done both books about both men, to evaluate their relative merits. And Roy concluded that comparing uh, Gladstone and Churchill, he thought Churchill was the most extraordinary human being uh, ever to have occupied 10 Downing Street. <laughs> 
And although the turnover of prime ministers has recently been quite rapid, I don't think we're in any way obliged to modify or adjust, let alone overturn, that verdict in the light of recent uh, events. One of the ways, of course, in which Roy's book about Churchill gets him so well um, is that, like Churchill, Roy believed that public duty, doing the state some service on the one hand, and good living on the other were not at all opposed or antithetical, that good living was, on the contrary, the essential precondition for carrying out uh, the public business of the state. That was how Roy lived his life, and he understood uh, in a way that few politicians today do, that that was how Churchill lived his life as well. And, of course, he also understood that Churchill had more hinterlands than any other uh, major 20th century prime minister, and, of course, art became a hugely important element of that. None of you, I'm sure, need reminding that Winston Churchill was born in 1874 in Blenheim Palace, which was then one of the greatest treasure houses of Britain. Uh, and Churchill remained, of course, devoted to his ancestral home all his life, and in his later years, he would vividly and affectionately depict its splendid interiors, uh, here's one of them, and its spectacular exteriors. But this artistic heritage made no lasting impact on young Winston because it was significantly diminished during the mid-1880s when most of the greatest pictures collected by the first Duke uh, were dispersed to the National Gallery in London and to the sale rooms. And that irreparable aesthetic damage was scarcely compensated for when, 20 years later, Churchill's cousin, Sonny, the ninth Duke of Marlborough, commissioned John Singer Sargent to paint his bravura family portrait, which, of course, adorns the central saloon in Blenheim to this present day. The sale of the greatest pictures in the Marlborough collection may help explain why Churchill never seems to have evinced any interest in European old masters or in the great tradition of English portraiture, running from Hogarth via Van Dyck and Lawrence uh, to Sargent himself. And it's surely significant that his most successful paintings of Blenheim interiors are of rooms hung with tapestries celebrating his greatest forebear, the first Duke of Marlborough, rather than with the less distinguished canvases that had survived the depredations of the mid-1880s. The disappearance from his ancestral home of the greatest Blenheim pictures when he was still a boy may well be one of the reasons why Churchill would later claim that apart from a few drawings rather reluctantly undertaken and unsuccessfully undertaken while he was at school and at Sandhurst, he demonstrated no serious awareness of art or appreciation of art at any point during the first 40 years of his life. Such was his recollection, as reported years later by Clementine Churchill and as recorded by Lord Moran. When, Clemmy recalled, Winston took up painting in 1915, he'd never up to that moment set foot in a picture gallery. He went with me to the National Gallery and pausing before the first picture, a very ordinary affair, he appeared absorbed in it. For half an hour, he studied its technique minutely. Next day, we again visited the gallery, but I took him this time by the left entrance instead of the right entrance, so that I might at least be sure he wouldn't return to the same picture again. Such indeed, then, is the conventional wisdom about Churchill's belated engagement with what he once called paints, palettes, and canvases, a conventional wisdom that he himself did much to create and to promote when he came to write the essays that would later be republished as painting as a pastime. But as is so often the case with Churchill, things turn out on closer investigation to be much more complicated and much more interesting than at first glance they might appear. Beyond any doubt, Clementine Churchill's testimony that I've just quoted merely reinforces the view put forward by the historian J.H. Plum that despite Churchill's many and extraordinary range of gifts, there was always about him in his paintings as in so much else, these are Plum's words, not mine, a touch of the Philistine. His literary culture was largely confined to that of his class and his time. The Bible, Shakespeare, Milton, Scott, Dickens, and a little trollop topped off with Rudyard Kipling. 
His taste in music was restricted to Gilbert and Sullivan, the late Victorian Music Hall, Viennese Operetta, Military Marches, Land of Hope and Glory, and Rule Britannia. He did not turn hungrily to the works of philosophers, economists, or social scientists, and he showed no interest in engaging with Marx or Freud, the giant intellectual figures of his youth and middle age. His models in history writing were not the innovative scholars of his own time, but two men long since dead, namely Gibbon and Macaulay. And in addition to showing no interest in European old masters or the great tradition of English portraiture, Churchill never evinced any enthusiasm for abstract art as it developed and evolved during his long lifetime in the hands of such innovative masters as Picasso or Chagall. Not surprisingly then, and as Hedwina has already very properly mentioned, Churchill's first appearances at the Royal Academy Summer Dinners in 1908, 1911 to 13, and 1919 were because of his importance as a government minister, not because he was expected to have anything significant to say about art. Yet while it is easy to dismiss him as being in some ways culturally uninformed, incurious, and unsophisticated, Churchill was in other ways both exceptionally imaginative and remarkably creative, no less, in the words of A.L. Rouse, an artist than a politician. And this was something he owed, like many of his relatives, to his Spencer rather than his Marlborough forebears, and also perhaps to his mother's family, the Jeromes of New York City. His otherwise rather wayward nephew, John Churchill, who was the eldest son of his younger brother, Jack, made a successful career as an artist and sculptor and as a painter of murals, portraits, and frescoes. Churchill helped John on his way, employing him in the late 1940s uh, to decorate the summer house at Chartwell with scenes of the Duke of Marlborough's four greatest battles. In the same way, Churchill's equally wayward cousin, Claire Sheridan, who was the daughter of Lady Randolph Churchill's elder sister, was an accomplished sculptor. And although Claire and her uncle disagreed violently about politics. Claire was an ardent supporter of communist Russia and sculpted a bust of Lenin two and a half times life size. She did compete a memorable bust of Churchill himself in the 1920s and another in the early 1940s, though neither were quite on the same epic scale. And in later generations, Winston's daughter Sarah would be an actress and a painter albeit of unhappily unfulfilled promise. And of course, her granddaughter, uh, Edwina, is a renowned uh, sculptor and artist. Churchill's genetic inheritance therefore seems to have included a genuinely artistic and creative strain. But he was exceptionally pronounced and well-developed in his own case. From an early age, he seems to have been gifted with the heightened perception of the artist, to whom no scene, no event, no individual was ever dull or humdrum or commonplace. This is self-evidently true in his use of the English language, which he handled in his conversation, his speeches, and his books, with a sure touch, the sensuous feel, and the imaginative brilliance of an artist, as he delighted in strong words, rich imagery, polished antitheses, arresting alliterations, glowing phrases, and memorable effects. There was nothing dull or humdrum or commonplace about his use of words. And although his canvases lack the stately grandeur, the heroic splendor, and the formal magnificence of his greatest set-piece orations, they strikingly resemble his speeches in other ways, often being bright, vivid, highly colored, and brilliantly illuminated creations full of arresting contrasts between the light and the dark, the sunshine and the shadows. And when Churchill later wrote about painting, one of his descriptions of the finished product as a long, sustained, interlocking argument, characterized by a single unity of conception, would apply with equal appropriateness to the composition and to the structure of his greatest speeches as well. What is more, Churchill not only possessed a powerful verbal imagination, but he was also endowed with an equally strong visual imagination and visual sense and appreciation. Lord Moran once observed, Winston sees everything in pictures. While I don't think he saw everything in pictures, he certainly, certainly saw a great deal. 
Despite his own later insistence to the contrary, the drawing classes he had taken at Harrow and at Sandhurst do seem to have made a lasting impact on him. And he was also fascinated by political cartoons from an early age. Even in his first books, Churchill demonstrated a great capacity to visualize a scene, to evoke landscapes, to describe cities and towns and villages, and to capture in words the din and destruction of battle. He also recognized the importance of illustrations in the form of drawings and photographs as an essential accompaniment to the printed text. And he was especially concerned to furnish detailed maps of the many battles he witnessed, participated in, and described. All this may in turn explain Churchill's later interest in moving pictures and the cinema. During the 1930s, he wrote several screenplays for Alexander Corder and his London film production studio, though none of them in fact ever went into production. He made friends with Charles Chaplin, whom he met in Hollywood and who later visited Churchill at Chartwell, where it soon became clear that politically they had very little in common. And in 1935, he wrote an essay comparing the relative merits of silent and talking films, and perhaps surprisingly, he thought silent films had a better future. And of course, in the Second World War, at Chequers, late night films were Churchill's preferred and essential form of relaxation. Well, here is one example of Churchill's extraordinary capacity from an early age to convey a scene and evoke a landscape in a word picture. It's from his one and only novel, Savrola, and it describes the broad panorama that could be glimpsed from the balcony of the presidential palace in the fictional Republic of Lorania. This is what Churchill wrote. The scene which now stretched before her was one of surpassing beauty. The palace stood upon high ground, commanding a wide view of the city and the harbor. The sun was low on the horizon, but the walls of the houses still stood out in glaring white. The red and blue tiled roofs were relieved by frequent gardens and squares, whose green and graceful palms soothed and gratified the eye. Many white-sailed smacks dotted the waters of the Mediterranean Sea which had already begun to change their blue for the more gorgeous colors of sunset. Now that is not only a vivid and evocative word painting, but it is, I think, not at all coincidence that it also anticipates many of the harbor scenes along the French Riviera and the Mediterranean coast that Churchill would become so fond of depicting in the 1930s onwards. Originally, he created pictures on the page, subsequently, he created pictures on his canvases. So while he did not actually take up painting as a pastime until his 40th year, Churchill clearly had more going for him when he eventually started than he would in fact later admit. Nevertheless, and as is well known, he took the activity up suddenly, unexpectedly, and therapeutically, and with characteristic relish, but with uncharacteristic diffidence. During the summer of 1915, his spirits were at their lowest ebb in the aftermath of the Dardanelles disaster, for which, fairly or unfairly, he bore the brunt of the political blame as First Lord of the Admiralty. Out of power, and very soon out of office, he was haunted by what he termed the black dog of a depression so deep that Clementine feared that he would die of grief. Just as a drowning man grabs a life belt, so Churchill now turned to painting as a new way to engage his energies, to blot out political failure, to banish the black dog, to revive his spirits, and to enable him to try to begin enjoying life once again. At the time, Winston and Clementine had rented Hoe Farm, a small country house in Surrey, where Churchill's brother Jack and his wife Gwendolyn, known as Goonie, often came to stay. And it was Goonie, depicted here, in fact, by Churchill, who first persuaded him to paint, though she herself was a watercolorist, whereas Churchill soon came to prefer oils as a much stronger and more robust medium. Churchill was immediately hooked by the challenges and by the opportunities of painting. And during these early years, 
he experimented with a variety of styles and a variety of subjects. Perhaps because one of the first artists to whom he turned for advice was Sir John Lavery. Churchill began painting far more portraits at this time than he would later do. One of which uh, is this extraordinary searing self-portrait, probably from 1915, an extraordinary depiction of bleak, desolate melancholy. Here is painting not as the antidote to the black dog, which it very soon became, but as a means actually of depicting it. The black dog is really there. When he then went off to the Western Front in 1916, he took his brushes and his easels with him, and the result was a succession of powerful wartime paintings of devastating buildings and war-torn countrysides. Very different again, and much more portentous in terms of how his own techniques and interests would develop, were these bright, warm, sunlit pictures that he had painted in Cairo in 1921 when he attended a conference there as colonial secretary, and which, of course, very much anticipate his later canvases of Marrakesh. By this time, for Churchill, painting was a serious business. From the early 1920s, he began to visit galleries on a much more systematic basis than had been the case with his first visit with Clementine, and he fell in love with the impressionist use of light and color and he eventually would establish a studio at Chartwell where he would spend many happy hours when not dictating his books or laying bricks, building walls, and building cottages in the grounds. The result of all this, this sudden newfound interest, was that across more than four decades, Churchill would eventually complete somewhere in the order of 500 canvases, an extraordinary output given the many other calls on his time his energy, uh, and his imagination. And in terms of his non-political activities, his painting would soon come to rank second only to his writing. But there were two significant and revealing differences. Churchill wrote for serious public purposes, to celebrate his family, to vindicate his own record. Remember his observation, history will not be kind to Neville Chamberlain, I know, because I'm going to write it and also to make the substantial sums needed to finance his lavish style of life. By contrast, he seems to have painted entirely for therapy and for enjoyment. It helped keep the black dog at bay. It was a hobby and a relaxation rather than an occupation, and he never intended to sell his canvases for serious money, though he did hope Clementine would be able to do so if the need later arose, which of course it did. But in addition, and again unlike his writing, and indeed unlike virtually everything else that he did when he was awake, painting was the only activity that Churchill carried on, even when surrounded by a large entourage in the later years of his fame and glory in concentrated and complete silence. It's the only thing he did when he didn't talk. When he painted, it absorbed him utterly taking his mind off everything else and off everybody else, too. By the early 1920s, then, Churchill had become sufficiently experienced to set down his thoughts on painting in several articles which initially appeared in the Strand magazine. And along with Savrola, they are among the most self-revealing words he ever wrote. They were, he explained to Clementine, very light and amusing, without in any way offending the professional painters, a concern Churchill always had. For someone with such a towering and self-centered ego, Churchill wrote with uncharacteristic humility and self-deprecating candor about his own limited artistic talents and his modest painterly efforts as a self-confessed weekend and holiday amateur. We must not be ambitious, he insisted. We cannot aspire to masterpieces. We must content ourselves with a joyride in a paint box. And for this, he concluded, audacity is the only ticket. He wrote in favorable terms of John Ruskin and shared his delight in vivid colors. I rejoice with the brilliant ones, he wrote, and feel genuinely sorry for the poor, dull, drab browns. Elsewhere, Churchill once wrote, light is life. And of course, there could be no more vivid contrast to the black dog than that. He also wrote appreciatively of Turner and the French Impressionists, especially their fascination 
with the effects of light on landscape and of water. And he also, rather interestingly, wrote appreciatively of Matisse as well. As befitted a former soldier, he envisaged his painterly encounters with intimidatingly empty canvases as battles of will, which he was determined to win by an overwhelming display of forceful colours and colourful force. Painting, he also went on, gave a heightened sense of nature, cultivated the memory, absorbed the mind without fatiguing the body, provided a great incentive to travel, and furnished a hobby and a distraction which, with any luck, would be a lifelong comfort and companion, point to which I will return. By the mid-1920s, Churchill had largely, not entirely, but largely given up painting people, and he'd settled on landscapes and vistas, still lives and interior and exterior scenes, warm, brightly lit paintings, the antidote to the black dog, no longer the expression of it, as his preferred subjects. As these canvases accumulated, he became increasingly widely known as an amateur painter, which meant that he now attended the annual dinners of the Royal Academy, not only as a major politician, he was Chancellor of the Exchequer in Stanley Baldwin's Conservative government of 1924-9, but also as a recognised and reputable amateur artist. In 1927, in replying to the toast to His Majesty's government, Churchill spoke on art and politics insisting that artists were among the most fortunate mortals on the globe because their work was also their joy. The paintings on display this year, Churchill went on, were the result of hours of pleasure, hours of intensive creative enjoyment, resulting in what he revealingly and characteristically described as bottled sunshine, captured imagination, perennial delight. In comparing art and politics, he continued, flair and judgment were equally necessary in both activities. And there were three dominant elements of each profession that were common to both, namely colour, proportion and design. Churchill had no doubt which of these three were the most important and which he himself preferred. Colour ranks far above proportion and design, both in painting and in politics. I admire it very much indeed in painting, he went on. And to general amusement, he added, I'm not entirely, entirely averse to it in politics either. Although he did also concede that in art, no less than in politics, colour needed disciplining by proportion and design. Not everybody, of course, thought Churchill was as good on proportion and design as he undoubtedly was on colour. During the 1930s, Churchill was out of office for most of the decade. He spent much of his time writing his multi-volume biography of the first Duke of Marlborough, and painting was his preferred form of recreation and relaxation. Many of his best pictures of English country houses, where he and Clemmy uh, often visited, uh, date uh, from this time. Uh, also uh, including uh, some Blenheim interiors and many paintings. Here's one uh, of Chartwell. And he also stayed in and painted the houses of uh, his rich friends who owned houses in France, Lord Rothermere, Maxine Elliot, and above all, Consuelo Bolzan. Consuelo, of course, previously Duchess of Marlborough, in that great sergeant portrait, she divorced the Duke uh, and married a rich Frenchman. And here is a memorable account by Consuelo, who remained a lifelong friend of Winston's, of Churchill as a house guest and an artist, staying with her and her second husband in France. He used to spend his mornings dictating to his secretary and his afternoons painting either in our garden or in some other site that pleased him. And here indeed is one of his paintings uh, of Consuelo's uh, house. His departure on these expeditions was invariably accompanied by a general upheaval of the household. Wherever Churchill stayed, a general upheaval of the household tended to be what necessarily, uh, as you were, went on. The painting paraphernalia with its easel, parasol and stool had to be assembled. The brushes freshly cleaned to be found, the canvas chosen, the right hat sorted out, the cigar box replenished. At last, driven by our chauffeur, accompanied by a detective the British government insisted upon providing, he would depart with the genial wave and rubicund smile which we have learned to associate with his robust optimism. On his return, he would amuse us by repeating the comments of those self-sufficient critics who congregate round easels. An old Frenchman one day told him, with a few more lessons, you really might become quite good. <laughs>
It was also during the 1930s that Churchill fell in love with the bright colors and warm sunshine of the French Riviera, and he also discovered for the first time uh, the painterly potential and delight uh, of Marrakesh. And notice again how bright, vivid, sun-drenched, and highly colored these pictures are. Although out of power, Churchill attended the Royal Academy dinners regularly during his wilderness years, and he spoke on several occasions. In 1932, his subject was political painters, for, as he again uh, put it, I would not dream of lecturing the Royal Academicians on your art. Instead, in a wonderfully fanciful speech, he chose to imagine the artistry that might be exhibited by members of the national government from whose ranks he had been excluded. <clears throat> In particular, he spoke about Stanley Baldwin, the Prime Minister, whose carefully cultivated rustic self-image was, Churchill felt, rather lacking in colour and precise definition. And Churchill could imagine Baldwin painting such implausibly bucolic offerings as the Worcestershire farm, pigs in clover and broccoli in autumn. Six years later, Churchill spoke again this time on tradition and novelty in art. The functions of such an institution as the Royal Academy, Churchill insisted again choosing his words very carefully, is to hold a middle course between tradition and innovation. Without tradition, art is a flock of sheep without a shepherd. Without innovation, it is a corpse. But innovation had its limits. It is not the function of the Royal Academy to run wildly after novelty. Now more than ever, Churchill believed it was the purpose of the Academy to give strong, precious, and enduring aid to British painting and sculpture. In this hard material age of brutal force, he concluded, speaking only a few weeks after Hitler had annexed Austria, we ought indeed to cherish the arts. Ill fares the race which fails to salute the arts with the reverence and delight which are their due. And one of the points that Churchill made on more than one occasion in his speeches during the 1930s was that democracies provided the freedom for artists to flourish. Dictatorships did exactly the opposite. During the Second World War, when he was a titanically busy man, as affairs of state took all his waking and working hours, Churchill gave up his brushes and his canvases almost completely. But here are two revealing episodes. The first is the powerful painterly image he used to such telling effect in the peroration of his great speech ending, this was their finest hour, in which he contrasted the abyss of a new dark age, the black dog for everybody, into which Europe would sink if Hitler tried to the broad sunlit uplands, light is life for everybody, which might be gained if he could be defeated. Broad sunlit uplands were the vistas which Churchill greatly loved to depict, and they now became the metaphorical destination to which he hoped he might lead his country and its allies. And appropriately, the second episode, the only canvas Churchill completed while Prime Minister during the war could be described in exactly those terms. A view of Marrakesh, drenched in sunlight and rising towards the high peaks of the Atlas Mountains in the distance, which he painted in January 1943 after his earlier meeting with President Franklin Roosevelt in Casablanca. Churchill and FDR both subsequently visited Marrakesh, and once the President had departed, Churchill set to work with his paints. It was a brief break from the pressures of war, and Churchill later gave the painting to Roosevelt as a memento of their visit. But then it was back to work and back to war once more. Just as Churchill had discovered the therapeutic value of painting at a dark time in his life during the First World War, so he turned to it again in the aftermath of his electoral defeat in the summer of 1945. Even before the votes had been counted, he'd gone off to the south of France for a brief holiday, where he had taken out his paints for the first time since Marrakesh. 
and in September, he headed to Italy, to the shores of Lake Como, where Field Marshal Alexander, the supreme Allied commander in the Mediterranean, a Churchill favorite, and also, it's important to remember, a fellow painter, offered him his villa. As after the Dardanelles, the therapy soon uh, worked. And in a month, he produced 15 pictures, of which that's one. I paint all day and every day, he wrote to his daughter Mary, and have banished care and disillusionment to the shades. Alex came and painted too. I'm confident, he told Clementine, that with a few months of regular practice, I shall be able to paint far better than I have ever painted before. And during those years of opposition, when, of course, he was leading the Conservative Party in Parliament and writing his war memoirs and making triumphant visits to the United States and to many of the capital cities of Europe, he also painted a great deal, much of it done in his studio at Chartwell, and France and Morocco were again a special favourites. Painting picnics on these holidays were often organised on a lavish and elaborate scale and Churchill produced some of his most successful works during this period. Here is another warm, sun-drenched rendition of the countryside near Marrakesh, and here is another uh, French Riviera uh, painting. By this time, though, Churchill's painting was no longer just a private hobby uh, and for personal therapy. It was also an inseparable and cumulative part of his now vastly enhanced public reputation, and global fame. As the man of the half century, the accolade which Time magazine would bestow on him in 1950. Three years earlier, Churchill had submitted two pictures to be hung at the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition, which had just been revived. Here's one of them. It is, of course, uh, of Chartwell. Under the name of David Winter. Uh, both were accepted. In 1948, following a unanimous resolution of the Council and the General Assembly, Churchill was then elected an honorary academician extraordinary, the only person ever to be so recognized and honored. And as soon after, his earlier writings on art, from which I've already quoted, were republished in a book as Painting as a Pastime, which became a bestseller and was translated into many languages. In 1949, the annual Royal Academy Summer Dinner, held on the eve of the summer show, was revived after a lapse of 10 years, in part thanks to Churchill's prompting. At the end of it, the then President, Sir Alfred Munnings, made a speech broadcast live on the BBC, which it would be polite to call uninhibited and more accurate to describe as deplorably intoxicated in which, although president, he denounced the academy itself, the Arts Council and the Tate Gallery, and inveighed against such foolish daubers, as he called them, as Cezanne, Matisse, and Picasso. Churchill, was not, who was present, was not wholly amused by that. So great was the outrage caused by Munning's speech in the art world that he soon had to resign as president. By contrast, Churchill's relationship with the Academy went from strength to strength, and he exhibited at the summer show every year between 1948 and 1951. During his second final premiership, from early 1951 to the spring of 1955, the press of events and his own advancing years meant Churchill once again had little time for painting. But he covered a few canvases on his occasional sojourns at Lord Beaverbrook's Mediterranean villa. And on a brief trip to Jamaica in the aftermath of a visit to the American president, he lectured Noel Coward on why you ought to paint with oils, not with water colors. Two of Churchill's last cabinet colleagues, R.A. Butler and Lord Alexander, were both accomplished amateur artists with whom Churchill had painted and would paint again. And so, of course, interestingly, was President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who actually completed a portrait of Churchill during this time, albeit one uh, from photographs. Every year, Churchill continued to exhibit at the Royal Academy, and he was a regular attender and speaker at its summer banquets, where he continued to urge the need to hold a middle course between tradition and innovation. In 1953, he insisted that the arts are essential to any complete national life and that the nation owes it to itself to sustain and encourage them. The following year, brooding as he was by then on the terrible perils unleashed by the hydrogen bomb, he urged that the arts have a noble and vital part to play in helping mankind deal with these gigantic powers which confront us with problems never known 
before. In the spring of 1955, Churchill retired as Prime Minister, and his political life was effectively over. Freed for the last time from the cares and burdens of high office, his final decade would be one of private leisure, and as he had earlier foreseen in one of the essays republished in painting as a pastime, his brushes and his canvases would play a large and fulfilling part in it. One by one, he had written there, the more vigorous sports and exacting games fall away. Exceptional exertions are purchased only by more pronounced effort and more prolonged fatigue. Muscles may relax and feet and hands slow down. The nerve of youth and manhood may become less trusty. But painting is a friend who makes no undue demands, excites to no exhausting pursuits, keeps faithful pace even with feeble steps and holds her canvas as a screen between us and the envious eyes of time or the surly advance of decrepitude. Happy are the painters, for they shall not be lonely. Light and color, peace and hope will keep company to the end or almost to the end of the day. And so, during the late 1950s, Churchill spent a great deal of time once again uh, on the French Riviera, relishing its warmth and sunshine and light and colour, and usually staying either with Lord Beaverbrook uh, or with Emily and Wendy Reeves. And in such luxurious surroundings and with such congenial company, he completed his four-volume history of the English-speaking peoples and painted many of his late works. And there was also a final trip uh, to Marrakesh. But Churchill's last decade was not only one of private leisure, it was also one of public apotheosis, as he became uh, and remained until his death the most famous man in the world. And here, too, his pictures played their part. In 1958, an exhibition of 35 of his paintings was put on in Kansas City, and the introduction to the catalogue was written by his former colleague and fellow artist, President Eisenhower. So popular and so successful was this exhibition that he traveled elsewhere in the United States, including to the Smithsonian in Washington and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And it then went on to Toronto and Montreal in Canada, to eight cities in Australia, and to four cities in New Zealand. And although Churchill had previously resisted any attempt to put on a one-man show in London, the success of this North American display emboldened the Royal Academy to ask again. And the resulting exhibition, augmented by 26 additional canvases, finally opened in London in March 1959. It was a huge success, and its run was extended from the end of May to the end of July, by which time over 140,000 people had visited, a greater number than for any exhibition ever held by the Royal Academy in the same spaces, except for one devoted to Churchill's fellow artist, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> we think, the president of the Royal Academy wrote to Churchill on its closure, it has deservedly marked in the most effective and significant way your historic membership of the Royal Academy, thus crowning your extraordinary title in our annals. By then, of course, Churchill was visibly aging as the surly advance of decrepitude was indeed becoming irresistible, and as the end of the day drew inexorably closer. He painted his last canvases in the autumn of 1960 and perhaps early in 1961. Some of them were wistful and sad. The vigor that had imbued his earlier work uh, was no longer there. The sunshine, the warmth, the color had largely disappeared, and the black dog uh, once again was back. Yet he continued to exhibit earlier works at the Royal Academy until his last summer of 1964, by which time he had contributed more than 50 paintings to the annual exhibitions without any break since 1947. His attendance at the summer dinner also remained a fixture in his annual schedule until 1963, and he was invariably accompanied by his bodyguard, Sergeant Murray, himself a talented amateur painter. And there is Sergeant Murray standing above uh, Montgomery and Churchill. In 1959, and in the midst of his triumphant one-man show, Churchill was acclaimed by Harold Macmillan at the summer banquet that year as the greatest living amateur painter, an observation that was greeted with rapturous applause. 
Two years later, Harold Nicholson confided this affectionate, if rather sad, entry to his diary. I went to the Academy banquet and enjoyed it very much. But I watched Winston leaving. The president took one arm and an attendant another, and they almost carried the old boy down the steps. He is frightfully old. His eyes are bleary and immobile. I watched his huge bald head descending the staircase, and I blessed it as it disappeared. A voice behind me said, we may never see that again. I turn round. It is Clement Attlee. As someone whose father had died young, as someone who for much of his life did not expect to live out his full biblical allotted span, and as someone who had so often witnessed the carnage, the waste, the ruin, the killing of war, Churchill had brooded much upon the transience and ephemerality of life and upon the meanings and mysteries of death. And never more movingly than in these words with which he began to draw to a close his majestic biography of the first Duke of Marlborough. The span of mortals, Churchill wrote there, the span of mortals is short. Their end, universal. It is useless to waste time lamenting the closing phases of life. Noble souls yield themselves to the gently falling shades which carry them to a better world or to oblivion. But which for Churchill was it to be? And which did Churchill think it would be? In truth, he never could quite make up his mind about the mysteries and ambiguities or possibilities of a future life after death. Having long been a religious skeptic, he often thought that death would indeed be the end, a sort of perpetual nothingness to which he gave the name Black Velvet. As someone who would never like dark colours, especially the sombre sepulchral finality of black, and who had spent all his life battling the black dog of debilitating depression, Churchill can hardly have been enthused by such a dark and dismal prospect. But in painting as a pastime, he set out an alternative vision of the next world, which was much more buoyant and optimistic as the light once again overtook the dark. When I get to heaven, he wrote there, I mean to spend a considerable portion of my first million years in painting. And so finally get to the bottom of the subject, assisted and enabled by a still gayer palette than I get here below, and by a whole range of wonderful new colors which will delight the celestial eye. And as Churchill lay on his deathbed in January 1965, certainly immobile and apparently insensible, his daughter Sarah claimed that his right hand was sometimes seen to move, as if already grasping for the heavenly paintbrush that might yet await him. If there is any justice in this world, and if there is any hope of the next, then somehow and somewhere Winston Churchill may even now be painting vividly and vigorously away. And after his long and extraordinary life of epic endeavours and heroic achievements, only the meanest of spirits and the coldest of hearts would begrudge him a well-earned repose in such a brilliantly illuminated eternity, full as in his presence it must surely be of light and colour, peace and hope. Thank you. Thank you, Sir David. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now have our final break of the afternoon, and we will begin our final panel at 3.30.